Hey, this is Dr. Rob. It's a rainy day here in the West Georgia Piedmont, so I'm filming in my studio once again, and I'm trying to answer the question, how long were the Israelites in Egypt? That doesn't sound like a, a biblical genetics question, but it is for two reasons. One, genealogy is a subset of genetics, and biblical genealogy is definitely part of biblical genetics. But also, time is very important for genetics. And the question of how long the Israelites were in Egypt affects the age of the universe by about 215 years. But first, let's tackle the biblical statements. We have God making a promise to Abraham, and he says this, Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be their servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nations that they serve, and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Okay, there's a lot of very interesting things in that one passage right there. First of all, God says that there are going to be servants. Second, he says it's going to be 400 years. Third, he's going to say he's going to judge that nation. Wow, that sounds like Egypt. They're going to come out with great possessions. Yeah, the Israelites went around and borrowed things from their neighbors before they left. They despoiled Egypt before they left. They came out with great possessions, etc. Oh, and the fourth generation. Well, what's a generation? Well, biblically, yeah, I don't know. Is that 30 years? No, I don't think the Israelites would have ever have had said, oh, the average human generation time is 30 years. That's a generation. I don't think they would ever have said that. Is that... If all the people alive at one point die, and then like the next child born who is ever alive at that point, is that a generation? I don't think anyone would have thought that either. Is it just, you know, the leaders? When this father's son, 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 four generations later, that's when it can come out? I don't know, and actually no one knows. But we're going to look at that because it's some very interesting things in the genealogy of these people that tells us about four generations. However, they weren't in the land for 400 years. The Bible says it was 430. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Okay, so was it 400 or 430? That's very difficult to answer, isn't it? Except, consider that Abraham at this point, when God made the promise, didn't have any offspring. Isaac was going to be born 25 years later. And then Ishmael was going to mock Isaac upon Isaac's weaning, which would have happened about the age of five. Oh, that would make 30 years. Then 400 years plus 30 is about 430 years. Oh, but wait a second then. If, we're, if the clock starts with Abraham, they're not in Egypt for 430 years. It's 430 years from the day they left to Abraham. Look at the words of Paul in Galatians. Now the promises were made to Abraham, the law which came 430 years afterwards. So Paul is starting the clock with Abraham, not with the arrival of Jacob in Egypt about 215 years later. So we have an argument here. It, are they in Egypt for 430 years or 215 years? And there's another 215 before that starting back to Abraham. That's hard to answer. I know that there is a rigorous academic debate about this. It's been going on for centuries. Even the famous Archbishop Usher, surprising to me, I didn't realize this, but when he gave us his famous 4004 BC date for creation, he was using the short sojourn. He was assuming Paul's statement here, the promise started with Abraham, and therefore they're only in Egypt for about 215 years. And I say about because it's not clear. We know how old Abraham was when he left Haran. He was 75. We know that God visited Abraham multiple times and made different promises to him at different times. We don't know when he made this specific promise about the 400 years. If it's the year he left Haran, fine. Then the Israelites are in Egypt for 215 years. If it's a couple years later, then it's still 430 years from that promise. The Israelites were in Egypt for a few more years than 215. We, we're not certain. Now, very interestingly, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, and the Samaritan Pentateuch both add some words to this description in Exodus 12. They say, Now the sojourning of the children of Israel and of their fathers, which they sojourned in the land of Canaan and in the land of Egypt, 
was 430 years. Now, I'm not going to get into Septuagint versus Masoretic debate. I've written a lot about that. That is on creation.com. You can just follow the links in the show notes if you're interested. I am a Masoretic guy. I think I have very good reasons for holding to the Masoretic. I don't think the Septuagint is the original Bible. And I don't think the numbers given to us in the Septuagint are the original numbers. I am tempted in that way because I would love to have an extra 1,200 or so years in Earth's history. I would love to have multiple centuries after the flood, which is what the Septuagint gives us because the time span from when the father is born to when he has his son is longer in the Septuagint, so we have more post-flood time. This question about how long the Israelites are in Egypt, I want them to be in Egypt for as long as possible. Because if I shave off 215 years, it's harder to fit that into secular history. But that doesn't mean I'm going to go there. I'm just admitting to you that there is a temptation. But consider the story of Gideon in the Old Testament. He was a judge. He was called to go fight some enemies. And 22,000 people showed up for the battle. And God said, no, that's too many. So they whittled the number down to only 300. And they went up against a force that was like a plague of locusts, like the sands on the seashore. And that's the, the description of the number of people they're going up against. They only had 300 guys. And they won. So perhaps we shouldn't worry about how much time we want, but just let the scriptures speak for themselves. So a colleague and I put our heads together. We're both uh, genealogy nerds and we both love biblical genealogies. Now I know that this is a part of the Bible where most people roll their eyes and they get really bored and they, you know, your, your Bible reading plan, you get up to the begats and you just kind of give up because it's like, I don't understand this. However, if you really dig into these biblical passages about who's the father of whom and the mother of whom, there's some gold nuggets in there that are really fascinating and it helps us to understand the biblical story if you understand how that person fits in with the rest of the people in the story. So we looked at all the genealogies that span the Exodus. Any genealogist will tell you that data is the worst thing to deal with. Family records are terrible. And any genealogist worth their salt will tell you, matter-of-factly, if your ancestor was leaving out names in their family tree, there is no way that you could build a family tree. It would be impossible, and there'd be no way for you to merge your family tree from one place with another. There would be too many conflicts. So when we made this family tree and all of the data lined up perfectly with no contradiction and no conflict, my conclusion was simple. This is a real family tree. There's no way that this tree could come about if they're missing generations because one person might miss a generation one place while someone else would miss a generation in another place. And how can you have aunts and uncles and cousins and uh, all this complex family relationships that worked out beautifully? I don't think there's missing generations here. Let's look at some of the fascinating things about this tree. Consider that Moses, Miriam, and Aaron, brothers and sister, are the children of Amran, who's a son of Kohath, who's a son of Levi. Consider also that their mother is Jochebed, a daughter of Levi. So Levi is their grandfather through their mother and their great-grandfather through their father. Yeah, he married his aunt. Okay, a little creepy, but that's what the record says. Aaron married a woman named Elisheba, who is a descendant of Judah. King David is also a descendant of Judah, and we have his generations going all the way back to Jacob through his son Judah, Perez, Hezron, Ram, Aminadab, Nation, Salmon, Boaz, Obed, Jesse, to David. Now, again, it's a bunch of names, don't mean much, but interestingly, we also have a biblical record that Rahab, the Canaanite prostitute who, rec who rescued the spies when they went to spy out Jericho, married Salmon. Their son Boaz married Ruth, the Moabite. They had Obed, who had Jesse, who had David. So the biblical stories here are pulling in different parts of the Bible and putting them together into the genealogy, as if this was a real genealogy and as if these are real people. Now, if you look at Jacob to Moses, you have Jacob, Levi, Kohath, Amran, Moses. That's more than four generations. If you go back to Abraham, it's even more than four generations. But from Kohath, Amran, Moses, that's only three generations. So when God told Abraham that they're going to come out having the fourth generation, that works here. 
Except when you look at something like uh, Joshua's lineage. Joshua is a descendant of Joseph. It goes going backwards. Joshua, Nun, Elishama, Aminadab, Ladan, Tehan, Tela, Rephith, Reshef, Rephoth, Bariah, Ephraim, Joseph, to Jacob. Well, that's a lot of names and that's a lot of generations. How can you have, say, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 generations to Jacob in Joshua's lineage, but only 1, 2, 3, following Moses' mother, in Moses' lineage, or 4 if it's Moses' father's lineage? How can you have one branch has lots of generations and one who has only a couple? Are there missing generations? Not necessarily. For several reasons. First of all, in any population, you're going to have the oldest child of the oldest child of the oldest child of the oldest child of the oldest child living alongside the youngest child of the youngest child of the youngest child. So you're going to have some people with lots of generations and some with few, even if they have the same ancestor. In the case of Joshua, he was chosen as a spy right at the beginning of the Exodus to go look at the land. Now, the spies came back and they brought back an evil report and the Israelites decided to rebel against God and they did not invade Canaan, so there's 40 more years of wandering. But Joshua was one of the two people who said, no, we can do this, and God blessed him for that. Therefore, he lived through the Exodus, as opposed to all the other men who were over 20 years old, and he was a leader of the invasion of Canaan. Many generations back to Jacob, Moses only has few. It's not impossible. In fact, it's kind of expected. But also... Joshua is not necessarily like the oldest man of his clan. He's chosen as a spy because he's a chief. He's probably the, like the oldest child of the oldest child in this lineage. Who knows how many generations are still alive at this time. But he's, they're like, okay, you're a young man and you're going to be the leader of this tribe. We're choosing you to go spy out the land for us. That sounds natural to me. I don't know if that's true, but that sounds natural. But there are other lineages that only have a couple of generations. Consider Achan, the troubler of Israel, the person who stole things from Jericho after God told them, don't steal anything. And he was discovered and they stoned him. But his, own, his father is Carmi, his father is Zimri, his father is Zerah, his father is Judah. So from Zerah, who went down into Egypt, it's just Zimri, Carmen, Achan, who came out of Egypt and made it into Canaan. It's only a couple of generations. There's multiple lineages here, but there's only a couple of generations. This is really fascinating. It looks like this is real data, and it looks like this data, these data, span the Exodus with no gaps and no problems. Except, do we have to have people like 300 years old here having children? Is that even possible? Because we know at this point people weren't living that long. Well, I want you to consider two things. In a long sojourn model, you have Jacob, uh, Joseph, and Levi, the brothers. They're all coming down into Egypt. Uh, Levi's son, Kohath, is born outside of Egypt, and he comes into Egypt also. Levi has a daughter, Jochebed. Kohath has a son, Amram. If you line all these people up, we know how long they live. Levi lived for 137 years. Kohath lived for 133. Amran lived for 147. His children, Miriam, Aaron, and Moses, we know how long each one of them lived. Moses lived 120 years and died right before the invasion of Canaan. So 40 years after the Exodus, which is probably about 1446 BC. Aaron lived for 123 years. He died right before the invasion of Canaan. Miriam, we're not sure how long she lived. Tradition says 126. That's a guess. We know she died around the same time as Aaron and Moses. We assume that she's the little girl in the story where Moses' mother makes a basket and hides him in the rushes. Oh, by the way, she did not float him down the Nile River. That is dumb, and it makes me angry every time I see that. People have this idea, oh, she, oh, she was singing, and here he is floating down the river like in the Disney cartoon. Oh, no. She put him in the reeds so he wouldn't float down the river and set her daughter, who we assume is Miriam, to watch over the basket. Later on, Miriam is at least old enough to have a conversation with Pharaoh's daughter when she finds the basket in the rushes. So we assume she's at least six, and so we put a date on her about 126. It's an assumption. But if you take all those ages using the entry into Egypt and the exit from Egypt, 446 BC minus, 120, uh, minus 430 years is 1876 BC, 
you can't span that time frame with these ages. So therefore, you can't have a long sojourn without missing generations. That's a very interesting puzzle. However, if you look at the short sojourn, you can absolutely do this. And this was a surprise to me. I did not expect this. But if you have a Exodus at 1446 BC, which again, it's an assumption, but you have to pick a date. And if that Exodus of 1446, 215 years prior is 1661, if you have Jacob, Joseph, Levi, and Kohath coming into Egypt, Jochebed is his daughter of Levi, Amran's a son of Kohath, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, we know how old they are at the Exodus. You know what? All of the ages line up just fine. In fact, we can slide the ages left and right a little bit on the timeline, and it still works just fine. So the genealogical data suggests no gaps. Paul's statement in Galatians suggests the clock starts with Abraham. And the genealogical data line up for a short sojourn. In the end, it looks like the Israelites were in Egypt for only 215 years. I don't know that specifically, but I think it's true because of everything I just said. And there's a lot more on this subject in my original article, How Long Were the Israelites in Egypt? Go to creation.com, look that up. It'll also be in the show notes. I think you will be blessed. In fact, there's a lot of things I skipped over just because I didn't want a two hour long video. My friends, I hope that was encouraging to you. Genealogy is a subset of genetics and biblical genealogy is very important to our discussion on biblical genetics. We can use it, some of even the esoteric passages that you wouldn't even think of, we can use that to defend a biblical timeline. And when you do so, it kind of looks like the Israelites were in Egypt for 215 years. You may have noticed that the last two episodes I've done are spin-offs from articles that I wrote for creation.com. Biblical genetics and creation.com work hand in hand. I was actually given permission by my employer, Creation Ministries International, to do the side project called Biblical Genetics on my own time. It gives me a platform to talk about things that I, I normally wouldn't ever present on a Sunday morning at a church. It's just too detailed and too nerdy. Biblical genetics has also been an idea factory for articles and other uh, see my products. As I'm working on some of my scripts and outlines and ideas, I said to myself, oh, wait a second, this needs to be an article for creation.com and I'll write the article first and then I'll take that article and I'll make a video on it just for fun. Some of this also is not something CMI would normally talk about. Like my article series, uh, the use of fetal cells and vaccines, medicines, and technology. I did a four-part video series on that. I actually wrote that as a idea for creation.com and we batted it around for a while and we said, you know, this really doesn't quite fit what we're trying to do here and there's too much controversy. And so I said, okay, fine. So I just took that and I put that on my side project on biblical genetics. This is fun and I love doing this. If you are a content provider or if you want to start making Christian content on the internet, we need more. I will tell you, get started. Just go for it. Just do it. Throw yourself out there. Embarrass yourself. Make terrible videos. You'll get better. But I'm getting better, I think. And I'm presenting to you ideas. I'm throwing things out there for the world to chew on. Some people hate me. Some people will revile me. I've had videos made uh, using my name in dishonor. Uh, all sorts of things. Um, I, I don't even bother tweeting anymore just because the tweetosphere is just, people are just so mean. But it's there for you. The world is there and we need more Christian content. If you are a content consumer like I am, I voraciously listen to podcasts and watch uh, YouTube videos and, and read articles on all sorts of different topics, but my time is split. The amount of time I spend in the Christian world is like this and in the secular world is like this because I love history. All, almost all my podcasts I listen to are military history podcasts. I watch a lot of YouTube videos on military history also. Military history is my favorite topic after genetics. But that means that the Christian world is only capturing a sliver, a slice, a small portion of the attention span even of the Christian community. So if you're going to start making YouTube videos or have a blog or something like that, don't expect that you're going to make a million dollars. You're not a Mark Rober. You're not going to conquer the YouTube algorithm by making something about the Bible. That's not the way it works. But we need more content. 
And what I encourage you, I want to encourage you to get out there and start making it. If you'd like to support biblical genetics, it's really easy. Go to uh, the show notes or go to buymeacoffee.com if you want to drop a couple dollars in my tip jar or go to patreon.com if you'd like to become a long-term supporter, monthly supporter. I have multiple people helping me out here and I really appreciate all of you. In fact, um, this month on buymeacoffee.com I had two new people, Craig C. Yeah, we go way back to high school. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. But Rob from Smithfield, I don't know who you are, sir, but you are awesome. Thank you. Stephanie S. Uh, Paza Cook Cuxo at RS2, John H, George B, and one anonymous donor. Thank you. You're helping me and encouraging me and getting my show going, keeping it going. Over on Patreon.com, I have several uh, long-term supporters. Uh, Dave H, M. Matsky, and Rob S. You are at the top level of support. Thank you, pit people. Thank you so much. In the middle level of Patreon, Mark K, Mike from Australia, Daniel P, James R, and Jeff VD. Now, again, I know... About half of those people and your wonderful supporters and friends and thank you. On the lower level in Patreon, Jonathan P, Paul P, Ted H, and brand new subscriber Chris R. Thank you. I want all of you to be blessed, not only supporters but also the listeners. I want you to be encouraged that the Bible can be followed and believed. I want you to think that there are answers to our biblical problems. The age of the earth is a tremendous problem. The Bible, though, says very specific things about the age of the earth, and I really think that the short sojourn is a stronger argument than the long sojourn. It's a very interesting puzzle, very curious data, and yet the genealogical data, the timeline data, and the statement of Paul in Galatians pretty much nails it down for me. Now, if you have a different opinion, wonderful, make a comment on this video. Or if you would like even more to help me, share this video, like this video, subscribe to my channel. In fact, I've uh, cracked well over 2,000 subscribers now, but I notice that most people don't watch the video even after subscribing. So if you're a subscriber, remember to click the bell when you subscribe, because that will tell you that there's a new biblical genetics video out there and it's time to watch it. And as my channel grows and it is growing, I'm uh, making inroads in different places, making contacts with new people. I'm looking for ways to uh, market a little better. I'm not very good at that. I'm terrible at social networking. Uh, but if you're out there and you like say, oh, I know how to get this on, I don't know, Instagram or whatever, I, I could really use some help there. But in the meantime, be blessed, be encouraged, walk with God, study your Bibles. Thank you.